Well, good morning and welcome to the Sunday morning service of Faith Baptist Church here on April the 5th. Yeah, we wish that we could be together uh, in the auditorium at church together, but still not able to do that uh, just yet. But I'm glad that you've joined us, whether you're watching on the internet or watching a DVD later or uh, listening to a CD. We're just glad that you're with us. And of course, uh, this is Palm Sunday. Next week is Resurrection Sunday. We've got a special announcement we're going to give you about that here in just a moment. But we want to go ahead and get started with some music this morning. We're going to start with the song Redeemed. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So I'm pretty sure you know the words to this one. So let's give a try on a few verses of Redeemed. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the in prayer. Father, we do thank you for the opportunity uh, to open the Word of God this morning. Lord, though we wish we were able to join together at our uh, beautiful auditorium there and see one another together, see our, our faces and, and hug one another and shake hands. Lord, we wish we could do that. That's just not possible right now. Lord, you knew that this time was coming. didn't take you by surprise, but we thank you that we're able, uh, by means of technology, to be able to still put the Word out. And Lord, there are some who are watching live this morning. Others will watch it later or listen to it on a CD. And so, Lord, we're still able to preach the Word. And I thank you for those that have been so faithful in listening to the messages, reading along in their Bibles, praying for me and others that are involved in the work here, praying for one another and giving, Lord, continuing to give for the ministry. We just thank you for that. And Lord, we look for the day when we'll all be together again in church, Lord, and then even greater, Lord, when we'll all be together with you in heaven. What a wonderful day that will be. But until then, we just want to continue to serve you here. And so pray that you bless uh, in the remainder of the service this morning. And we'll thank you for all you do in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, let's go ahead and sing another song here. Love Lifted Me. Again, I'm sure you know the words of this song. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Amen. But love lifted me. Let's sing a few verses of this. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, all my heart to him I'll give, ever to him I'll cling, in his blessing. 
blessed presence live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true, merits my soul's best song. Faithful, loving service to, to him belong. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, love lifted me. else could help love lifted me souls in danger look above jesus completely saved he will lift you by his love out of the angry waves he's the master of the sea billows his will obey he your savior wants to be be saved today love lifted me could help. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Amen. All right. Well, I'm sure that was good singing over there in your place as well. <clears throat> Let's sing little as much when God is in it. And I want you to listen uh, particularly to the third verse. It says, Are you laid aside from service, body worn from toil and care? You know, a lot of us are laid aside from service right now. We wish we could be in the service. We wish we could be going out uh, to the nursing home and going visiting folks door to door and visiting folks in the church. Uh, we're laid aside, not necessarily from our bodies being worn from toil and care, though there's some of that and there's some that are sick as well. But the second verse says, you can still be in the battle in the sacred place of prayer. You know, you got a lot of extra time on your hands right now. It'd be a wonderful thing to spend some of that time in prayer. Pray for me and for my family. Pray for your deacons and the other leaders in the church. Pray for one another. Pray for our country. Amen. Just because you're not able to come to church doesn't mean you're powerless. You can't do anything. We have great power in prayer. So uh, I hope you will We'll think about that as we sing that third verse, but let's sing uh, some verses of little as much when God is in it. In the harvest field now ripen, there's a work for all to do. Hark the voice of God is calling to the harvest calling you. a crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus name does the play your call to labor seem so small and little no it is great if God is in it and he'll not forget his own little is much when God is in it a crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus name are you laid aside from service body worn from toil and care you can still be in the battle in the sacred place of prayer yes little is much when God is in it labor not for wealth or fame crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus name and when the conflict here is ended and our ray on earth is run he will say to all the faithful welcome home my child well done little is much when God is in it labor not for or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. Amen. That's the question, not whether we're right where we'd like to be or not, but are we going in Jesus' name? Amen. 
And I hope that you have gathered um, at this time in Jesus' name, whether you're there in your living room or watching on your uh, television or on your computer or later listening to a CD or whatever it is, I hope that it's not just a time you've uh, just set aside to watch and not thought anything about it, but that just as when you come to church, you've prayed, you've prepared, and you've gathered in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, I want to continue on with the service. And first of all, I want to give you a few uh, announcements and prayer requests, and then we'll um, open the word. First of all, uh, the announcement is, of course, we are still having to meet this way. And I'm sure you've heard this week that the governor issued his stay in place order, shelter in place order, uh, saying that he doesn't want anyone gathering together groups more than 10 and things like that. And so that obviously continues and we continue to uh, acknowledge that and abide by that. However, we have a very special announcement. Next week, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, we, Lord willing, are going to meet at church. That's right. We're going to have our service at church at 11 o'clock. Now, just like we normally do on Easter Sunday, no uh, Sunday school. We won't have an evening service. We'll have one service, but it will be at the church at 11 a.m. Now, here's how we're going to do it. It's going to be a drive-up service. You've probably heard of some other churches doing this. So, what you're going to do is come to the church. You need to get there early because you're going to park differently than you normally do. We are going to have everything set up, my pulpit and everything we need, on the top of the steps in front of the auditorium, in front of the front doors, and you're going to pull up in the parking lot facing uh, the stairs, and we'll have some men there directing you so you know where to park so that you can see everything. Uh, we will have speakers set up so you can roll your windows down to here, but the main way you're going to hear is that uh, Hunter has uh, put together a radio transmitter that we can broadcast to the parking lot on FM 88.7. So if you go to turn your radio to FM 88.7 on Sunday morning, you won't hear anything right now, but Sunday morning when we turn it on, you'll be able to hear everything through your radio. It worked yesterday when we tried it out, so Lord willing, it'll work. Uh, if for some reason it doesn't, we'll crank the sound up and you can roll your windows down and hear it that way, but it'll be a lot better in your radio. Uh, and so we'll have our service there. Now, the one rule is you can't get out of your car. Uh, we're allowed to do this because we are staying in our car, staying separated. So because of that, the buildings will not be available, the restrooms, any of that. So it will be a shorter service, we promise. But if you'll get there, pull up, and you can see each other across the way, wave at one another, honk your horn at somebody, flash your lights if you want to, um, and we will have our Easter Resurrection Day service. It'll be a special time. We don't intend to continue to do this. Um, probably the next week we'll be back here doing this, but we just want to make this a very special service. I know I want to see y'all, and y'all want to see each other, and so at least we'll be able to see each other through our cars anyway. Um, so that's coming up. Uh, so make your plans uh, to be there next Sunday at the church, 11 a.m. Get there early so you can get a parking place. Don't forget about giving. Uh, we need you to continue to give during this time, and we appreciate your faithfulness. God will honor that. Um, but you can send your gifts, of course, to the church, Faith Baptist Church, P.O. Box 790, Blairsville, Georgia, 30514. Or you can bring them by the church. Rachel and I will be there on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Give us a call to make sure we're there. Sometimes we're having to run out and do errands and things, but uh, you can drop them off that way. But many of you have been sending in your tithes and offers, and we, we truly appreciate that, and God will honor that. Uh, so those are the main announcements that we have. I did want to also say, as I mentioned last week, the Lifeline screening has been canceled. That was supposed to be coming up very soon, but they did cancel that. We're going to try and get that rescheduled, though. As far as prayer requests, uh, I want to continue to pray for Sister Barbara Sarton there in the nursing home in Blue Ridge. Um, I need to pray for Sister Betty Pruitt as she's recovering at home from the fall that she had. Uh, Sister Kathy Morris has some pneumonia. We were afraid it could have been uh, coronavirus or something like that, but, uh, but she went to the doctor. They said, no, it's a touch of pneumonia. So we want to thank the Lord it's not worse and that she is on medication, uh, but we definitely want to be praying for her. And uh, let's see, I'm sure there are some others. Uh, Brother Larry Mandigo, we want to be much in prayer for him. Uh, he's had some dementia 
and Alzheimer's for a while now, but it's gotten worse over the last couple of weeks and uh, uh, is really struggling as caretaker. We spoke with her and said that he's just really struggling with that. So we want to be much in prayer for Brother Larry and just pray for one another during this time as well. Uh, but let's keep, keep those in our prayers especially. Well, we're going to go ahead and uh, pray and then open the Word of God. Father, we do thank you again for the opportunity to be here and study your word. Lord, as we think of this Palm Sunday, as we remember your triumphal entry into Jerusalem, uh, Lord, as the people came out and, and said Hosanna to you and recognized you as a king, Lord, I pray that we would truly do that in our hearts this morning. Lord, we do pray that you'd be with each request that was mentioned and that you'd work in a very special way in each of those. And Lord, again, we hope to be back together very soon. But Lord, until then, I thank you for these folks that are faithful uh, to be together and to read your word and watch the messages and give to the work. And Lord, just pray that you'd bless and be with us this morning. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Matthew 21 this morning. If you have your Bibles, open to Matthew chapter 21. And as I said, of course, this is Palm Sunday when we remember the Lord's triumphal entry into uh, Jerusalem. And of course, it also marks the beginning of the last week of the Lord's ministry before his resurrection, which again, we'll celebrate next Sunday. Lord willing, they're at the church. And by the way, if it's storm and rain, uh, we won't be able to do that because our equipment is out. It is under the cover, but if it's raining and blowing on that, we just can't do that. Uh, so pray for good weather next week week, but we intend to be together. And so but we begin that whole week uh, today. And the Lord's entry into Jerusalem is marked by some contrasts. Uh, the people have one reaction to him. The religious leaders have another. And even the Lord himself shows some righteous indignation as well as some great love. But in the end, the question it leads us to answer is, have you accepted the king? Have you accepted the king? Let me say, if you're not saved today, you're of your father the devil. You have a king. You're following someone. Somebody says, oh, I don't follow anybody but myself. And Satan has you fooled to believe that, to believe you're in freedom when really you're in bondage, a slave to sin. And if you don't trust Christ to save you before you die, you're going to hell. But we who are saved have surrendered to Christ and been made free from sin. And we have King Jesus as our Savior. But the question is, if we're saved, are we truly following him as king? Um, like we said, if you're not saved, he wants you to be saved. If you are saved, he wants to be the king in your life. And so we're going to look at this uh, very familiar passage uh, this morning. And the message is entitled, The Presentation of the King. And I can already tell you, we're not going to finish it this morning. But there are some very good and practical, important points that I want us to get here. And so we're going to dive into it. And then, Lord willing, finish it up in the evening service at 6 p.m., which will also be uh, put up online uh, right where you're watching this. But let's go ahead and, and uh, get into it. Matthew chapter 21, and uh, let's just uh, begin in reading in verse number 1. Matthew 21, verse 1, And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Bethpage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied, and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. And this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Sion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. And the disciples went, and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they sent him, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And so the Lord uh, sends his disciples to go and uh, get this donkey, bring him back. And they put him on him, and he rides 
rides into Jerusalem. As we know, he is beginning the end of his earthly ministry before his resurrection and ascension. And he begins it by entering into Jerusalem, riding on this donkey. And the people see it and they shout and they scream Hosanna and they're giving praise to him. Well, I want us to look at this uh, account in detail here. I want us to notice, first, first of all, the preparation of the king. In this first part of the account, we see that the Lord is going to need some transportation. And we may think that this is an inconsequential part of the story, but the truth is there is a lot for us to learn here. Uh, so let's look at it. We just read verses 1 through uh 11 there, but again in verse number 1 it says, And when they uh, drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethpage unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. So first of all we see the command. The Lord and his disciples had been in Bethany where his friends Mary and Martha lived with their brother Lazarus, uh, whom Jesus had recently risen or had raised from the dead. You remember that story. They sent to Jesus, said, Lazarus is sick. Your friend, would you come? And he waits four days. He comes. Uh, he's been dead four days, but then he goes. He rolls the stone back, says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came out of the tomb. And it was a wonderful time of celebration for Mary and Martha and Jesus and all the disciples and Lazarus, I'm sure. But that happened to begin to stir up more controversy among the religious leaders. Uh, it's hard to preach against someone or say someone is not of God when they're raising people from the dead. And so this had added to uh, what was already going on as they were uh, becoming increasingly concerned that he was going to, that the Lord was going to cause some real trouble uh, for them with the people as well as with the Romans. And now Bethpage is a small village uh, inside of what we would call the suburbs of Jerusalem. And this town, as well as towns all over the area, would have been absolutely filled with visitors who had come from all over the region for the Passover. And there would have been animals everywhere, donkeys and horses, camels, as well as lambs and other animals brought for sacrifice. And Jesus tells two of his disciples, quite possibly Peter and John, to go and find this one particular ass and colt and to untie them and bring them to him. The account in Mark tells us that Jesus knew that they would find him as soon as they entered the city. He knew exactly where he was be, would be and that he had never been been ridden on before. This is a very specific command and a very unusual one, but the Lord knew exactly what he was doing. And it was critical that they obey him to the letter. Jesus is closing in on his crucifixion and the climax of his earthly ministry. And just has been the case since his birth, every single thing in his life and in this week uh, must be done exactly according to prophecy. The Lord never did anything by chance. It was all done at the Father's command in his will and by prophecy. And this was no different. Um, I want you to see the prophecy. Uh, look again, Matthew 21, verse 4 and 5. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, now verse 5, here's the prophecy, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. I want you to read the prophecy itself. Turn back with me to Zechariah chapter 9. If you turn just to the left in your Bible, you'll come to Malachi, uh, the first or the last book of the Old Testament. And then if you go just before Malachi, continue to the left just a little bit, you'll get to Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 9, and I want you to uh, see this uh, prophecy that's being fulfilled. Zechariah chapter 9, verse number 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. And so Jesus is obviously fulfilling this prophecy. But notice it says that the king is coming on an ass and a colt. 
And they are to rejoice because of this. Oh, why is that? The reason is because he is just and bringing salvation. He is lowly. In other words, the king would come one day. He would come uh, peacefully offering himself to them as their king. If someone had uh, defeated another nation in battle and he was riding into their capital city, he would come on his war horse with all of his chariots behind him announcing that I have conquered you you and your king, and I'm here to take over. But if he came in riding on a colt, on a donkey, then he is coming meekly in peace. And that's what the Bible says in Zechariah, that's what their king would do one day. And so the Lord is fulfilling this prophecy uh, to the letter. This is what we now call the triumphal entry, but it is the fulfillment of this prophecy. But notice again in Zechariah 9, verse number 10, we just read verse number 9, which uh, prophesies his triumphal entry. Verse number 10 though says, and I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall seek peace or speak peace unto the heathen and his dominion shall be from sea even to sea and from the river even to the ends of the earth. Now this is referring to what his kingdom will be like when it is finally set up. His millennial kingdom. He will not just rule Jerusalem or Israel but from sea even to sea from the river even to the ends of the earth. So obviously this whole prophecy, verses 9 and 10, is about more than just the events recorded in the New Testament, the account of his triumphal entry. The entire prophecy looks forward to his millennial reign. Friends, the trumpet could sound at any time. When it does, the dead in Christ are going to rise first, then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together. We're going to meet the Lord in the air. We're going to go to heaven with him. After that, seven years of God's judgment is going to be poured out on this earth earth in what's called the tribulation period. At the end of that, the Lord is returning all the way to earth. We're going to come with him. He's going to put his enemies down and set up his kingdom from Jerusalem, his millennial thousand year reign. We will rule and reign with him. And verse number 10 speaks about that time. When he comes then, he's not coming peacefully. He's not coming to offer himself as king. He is coming to take over. He is coming to proclaim himself as king. And may I say that if you have not accepted him as savior, before that time, you will be forced to accept him as your king, but there will be no option then for you to be saved. May I say that it's far better for you to accept him now when he comes peacefully, when the Holy Spirit of God comes and knocks on your heart, when the word of God is preached, that you accept him now so that not only can you serve him as king willfully and joyfully, but he'll also be your savior. Well, he came and offered himself peacefully at this time. The truth is, if Israel would have accepted him at this time, events would have been put into motion for the second coming and the millennial reign immediately after his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. In other words, this was one of the most important days in the history of Israel and in the history of the world. But it all depended on whether they would recognize it and accept it for what it is. You and I, looking back at it from nearly 2,000 years in the future, we say, well, why couldn't they see who he was and accept him. But they at that time there was political turmoil going on they had re the Jewish religion there were people from all around the world pagan religions, all kind of things and he merely presented himself and they had to make a choice. By the way that's exactly what we're to do today we're not to go and put a gun to anybody's head and say you have to accept Christ of course if we did that and even if they said they would they haven't truly accepted him. The Muslim comes and he threatens to kill someone unless they uh, can convert to Islam. But the fact is they haven't truly converted to Islam. They've just said whatever they had to to save their lives. They don't realize that true conversion comes in the soul. Our weapon is the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God. We give the Word, the Holy Spirit works in the heart, and man has the choice, as we talked about in the Sunday School lesson this morning, the free will whether to choose that or not. I hope that you've chosen to accept Him. If not, I hope you will. You who have, you've accepted Him as Savior, will you accept Him as King? Will you put him on the throne of your life and say, you're my king, you're my Lord, and I want to serve you. And so we see uh, the preparation for the king. We see the command, and then we see the obedience. Again, verses 6 and 7, Matthew 21. Matthew 21, verses 6 and 7. And the disciples went. 
What did he do? He told them to go and they went. They simply obeyed and did as Jesus commanded them and brought the ass and the colt and put on them their clothes and they set him thereon. And so they simply obeyed. That's all they had to do. The Lord was, was fulfilling a great prophecy. This was a wonderful moment in the history of Israel and Jerusalem and the world. Their part in it was simply to obey. That's your and I, your, your part and my part as well. Sometimes we look at it and say, how can the whole world be reached with the gospel? The whole, uh, all of Union County, Fannin County, how can all of Blairs will be reached? The fact is he does the work through us. All we have to do is be obedient. What has he called us to do? That's what we're to do. And so we see the obedience here. Uh, turn with me to Mark chapter 11. I want to look at the parallel passage here in Mark chapter 11, the account of this same uh, event here. And I want you to see that the whole account is full of prophetic, uh, prophetic fulfillment and spiritual symbolism. Mark chapter 11 and we're going to begin reading in verse number 7. Mark chapter 11, verse 7. And they went their way and found the colt tied by the door without in a place where two ways met, and they loosed him. And certain of them that stood there said unto them, What do ye losing the colt? And they said unto them, Even as Jesus had commanded, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and cast their garments on him, and he sat upon them. I want you to think about this donkey here. Mark, uh, who likely got his information from Peter, uh, gives us specific details about where they found this donkey. This is one reason why we think Peter was one of the two disciples that were sent uh, to get the donkey. Now notice this donkey is nothing special, uh, there, but there is a lesson here for us. The Lord sent his disciples to find the donkey, just as he sends the Holy Spirit to find us. Aren't you glad that the Holy Spirit found you? You know, we look and say, boy, the whole world has got to be evangelized. What are we going to do? And we try and take it all on ourselves. We forget that we are just a very weak vessel. There is supernatural power that is working through the churches today. You say, how in the world could the gospel have gotten all over the world with just simple churches? Because God is working. The Holy Spirit is looking for people. God's not just sitting back saying, well, if they can find me, fine. They can be saved. No, he says, I want them. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, the Bible says uh, that he wants everyone to be saved. He sends his Holy Spirit. And by the way, he does so. The Holy Spirit works through the Word of God, never outside of the Word of God. So the Word of God is preached or it is taught or it's given in a track or witnessed to whatever it is. And the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God on the heart of man. And this donkey's just sitting there, and the Lord sends his disciples to go and get him, just as the Holy Spirit was sent to come and find us. In Exodus uh, 13, verse 13, it says that uh, this donkey would have been redeemed by a lamb, just as we were redeemed by the Lamb of God. To be redeemed, the, the Bible says that the firstborn belonged to the Lord. So you're supposed to sacrifice the firstborn. But he says you don't have to sacrifice them. You can redeem them. You can buy them back with the killing of a lamb. You remember when the children of Israel are there and they're getting ready to go out and that night, that Passover night, they said if you put the blood of the lamb on your doorpost, then the death angel will pass over you. Friend, if I die without the blood of Christ on my heart, I'm going to have to die for my sins. But because Christ died on the cross of Calvary and his blood is on my heart because I ask God to forgive me through the blood of Christ, then that death angel has passed over me. I have been redeemed. We sang redeemed earlier. It's not just a song we sing, it's the truth. This donkey, the Bible says back in Exodus, says that that donkey would have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, just as you and I were redeemed. And so just as the Holy Spirit was sent out from God to find us, and just as this uh, donkey had to be redeemed, so we, uh, we who are saved have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Mark also says that they found him in a place where two roads meet. Can I say that whenever the Lord finds you, it is at a crossroads. Wherever you're at in life, when this message has come to you, let's say you're not saved today. You've never trusted Christ as Savior. Maybe you've heard the gospel a million times and you've rejected it every time. Maybe this is the first time you've heard it. Either way, this message has come to you. Now it is April the 5th, 2020, 
and it's Sunday morning, maybe you're watching it live. Maybe somehow a CD has been put aside and years later someone has found it, given it to you, you've put it in, begun to play it. I don't know when or where or how you'll ever hear this message, but in some way it has come to you. In either way, this is a crossroad in your life. You have a decision to make. And Mark, it says they found him where two roads meet. You are on the broad road. We are all born on that broad way, on that broad road. It's the road that's wide. It leads to destruction. Many find that. Many go in there at. But there is a narrow road. And it crosses that broad road anytime the Word of God is preached. Anytime the Holy Spirit of God convicts you of your sin. But let me tell you this. You can't just accept it whenever you want. If you continue to reject it, finally he'll say, okay, fine. God is a gentleman. He won't force himself on anyone. There'll come a time where he says, all right, fine. I'll knock no more on your heart's door. Friend, if you're hearing this message at any time and the Holy Spirit of God is convicting your heart, realize you are at a place where two roads meet. Just as that donkey was, the Holy Spirit has been sent to you. Just as the disciples were sent to that donkey and the redemption has been made for your sins just as a lamb was slain to redeem that donkey. But you see, you have a choice to make. Will you get off the broad road and get on the narrow way or not? That was the choice. Matthew 7, 13 and 14 says, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. But straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. The Lord said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It is straight, it is narrow, there is only one way. And you stand at a crossroads today, friend. Maybe you're saved today. There's still a crossroads. Are you going to follow the Lord or not? Are you going to allow Him to be King in your life, Lord of your life today or not? Are you going to sit back and say, Lord, I'm just going to do this my own way. I've got this. I'll handle it. Are you going to say, no, Lord, you're my, you're my Savior. I want you to be my King. I'm going to follow you. We're both at a way where two roads meet. Not only did this donkey have to be redeemed, but he had to be released. It says they loose him. They untied him. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he said, loose him and let him go. Friend, not only does Jesus redeem us, but we who are saved, he releases us. We are bound to sin. You know, one of the greatest lies that Satan tells people is that when you're not saved, you're free. You can live however you want to, do whatever you want to do, but the fact is you are bound to sin. And you will remain bound to sin until the day you die and go to hell for eternity. But this donkey had to be released. They loosed him. Lazarus was released. He was loosed from his grave clothes. And if you've been saved, you have been released. You've been loosed from the bonds of sin. If not, you're still tied up. Satan will tell you you're free. Hey, man, you can do whatever you want to. But the fact is the world is appealing to your flesh because of their father, the devil, and you're doing exactly what he wants you to do. But this donkey here was not only redeemed, he was released. Now the donkey is released, and they bring him back to the master. And what does he do? You know, the donkey could have said... If donkeys talked, and of course they do in the Bible. You remember Balaam's donkey? We'll talk a little bit more about that later, maybe tonight. But donkey could have said, hey, I've been tied up to that post for so long. Now I've finally been released. I'm ready to get out of here. But instead, what does he do? He submits himself to the master. The master sits on him. They put their clothes on him. They set the Lord on him. And the Lord rides him. Listen, when we are released from sin, we then need to be submissive, submissive to the master and voluntarily allow him to be the king of our life. That's what this donkey does. That's just what we're to do. The Holy Spirit finds us at the crossroad of life. We are redeemed and released. We are to be ruled by the Savior. Our mission now is just as that donkey to lift him up. You realize as he rode through that streets, he was sitting up higher. People could see him. They didn't see the donkey. The donkey was just a beast of burden. But he was lifting up the Lord. Remember what John the Baptist said, I must decrease, he must increase. That's our job. We've been 
redeemed, released. We ought to desire to be ruled by him so that we might lift him up. A wonderful story here. We're going to pick this up tonight here at 6 p.m. I hope you'll tune back in. But until then, I want you to answer that question. Have you accepted him as Lord and Savior and is he king of your life? Father, I thank you for this time we've had today. And Lord, as they shouted praise to your name, so we do this morning. But Lord, I pray that if there's any who doesn't know for sure they're saved, they would accept you as Savior today. And we who do, Lord, that we would make you king in our lives. We would lift you up and we'll thank you. Give us a good afternoon and bring us back together tonight and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us again and join us here at 6 p.m. in just a little bit for the evening service, the remainder of our message, and we'll see you then. God bless.